Okay. okay. Welcome everyone to the latest in the lecture series from Friends of Calligraphy. I'm Evelyn Eldridge, president of Friends of Calligraphy. Also on this call from among our council are Elena Carruthers, who is vice president, Nancy Noble, who's editor of the bulletin, Dean Rabino, our treasurer, Meredith Klein, who is membership chair, and Raul Ma Martinez, who's webmaster. I have just a couple of meeting reminders before we get started. The recording of this meeting will be available on the FOC website later today or maybe tomorrow. If you have questions for Kaz, who is welcoming your questions, either use the reactions tool to raise your hand or type three question marks and your question in the chat. Um, we are monitoring the questions and we'll be sure that Kaz gets to answer them. So that we can avoid unnecessary background noise, um, we're asking that everyone stay muted and Kaz and Meredith will unmute themselves. I'd like to introduce also uh, Meredith Klein, who is a longtime student and friend of Kaz. She's also, as I said before, our uh, wonderful membership chair. So Meredith. Oh, thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, teacher, and continuing source of inspiration, Kazuaki Tanahashi. To many of you, Kaz probably needs no introduction. He's known worldwide as an artist, a writer, and a peace and environmental worker. Born in Japan in 1933 and active in the United States since 1977, he became a member of Friends of Calligraphy in 1984. And that same year, he taught a class in East Asian calligraphy at the International Conference in Minnesota, where he also collaborated with Donald Jackson in a combined demonstration of Eastern and Western calligraphy in front of a rapt audience. He has taught classes at several other international conferences, and he still teaches workshops in the US and in countries around the world. As a painter and calligrapher, Kaz has been called the pioneer of one stroke painting. And he is the inventor of multicolor Zen circles called Enso. He continues to push the boundaries of brush calligraphy and painting. His work has been shown in exhibitions and in galleries, museums, and universities all over the world. He is also a scholar. As a writer, editor, and translator, he has produced over 40 books in English and Japanese, and he is still writing books. As an environmental activist, he was the founding secretary of Plutonium Free Future. As a peace activist, he worked against the nuclear arms race and two Gulf Wars. He is the founding director of A World Without Armies and is a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. We are so pleased that he has agreed to give this talk for us. Welcome, Kaz. Thank you. How are you, everyone? Can you hear me? Um, yes. and thank you very much, Evelyn and Meredith, for your generous introduction. Um, and also, thanks uh, the staff of Friends of Calligraphy for helping to uh, run this uh, show. Um, I'm an East Asian style calligrapher. So I study uh, Chinese classical masterpieces to a close study, kind of uh, faithfully copying, 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 and then uh, maybe getting some ideas about aesthetics and techniques of this art form. I think uh, calligraphers, East and West, mostly are classicists, right? For you, you know, 
uh, classical masterpieces are important and then become a kind of uh, maybe model and inspiration for your work, even if you do contemporary work. Um, the great majority of uh, calligraphers in China and the rest of East Asia use Sumi ink uh, on rice paper. So um, I don't know any other people who use uh, Western medium such as um, acrylic paint on canvas, which I do. Maybe I know only one person <laughs> who does it. But um, one, one, uh, another person who does it. But anyway, this is a wonderful medium. You know, it's um, canvas is so strong, so you can hit the canvas as hard as you want and you can splatter ink and then uh, the slashes stay as they are so it's very kind of present uh, instead of uh, ink on paper that will be absorbed and then sort of makes a big blot and also uh, with canvas, you can um, make pieces quite large. So um, I created two years ago um, 30 uh, pieces of uh, a series uh, with this Western medium acrylic paint on canvas. Uh, size is about four feet wide and seven feet tall. And uh, so the theme is um, Zen paradoxes. So uh, paradoxes, something like uh, it's seemingly kind of uh, um, something that doesn't make sense. But if you think deeply, it uh, it has some deep meaning. So that's a paradox. And Zen, uh, or Cham Buddhism, is uh, kind of uh, noted for uh, making a lot of paradoxical statement. But before that, I'd like to ask Raoul to show some sketches, maybe sketch A, so you can see that uh, I'm actually uh, spreading a paper of the same size as the canvas right next to it, and then making sketches with uh, maybe ballpoint pen, and then uh, maybe the next one. And then I will uh, use the same brush and same paint and then uh, go over it. This is, and then kind of, I actually uh, side by side, there's a canvas stretched, uh, and the staples on the floor of my um, studio, in which is in the basement of uh, my house in Berkeley, California. So you can see that this is what I'm doing uh, on the actual canvas. Yes, so you can see this is something small. And at the beginning of uh, one piece of work, which you'll see later. So I, I'm using a small brush. Yeah, next, please. 
So you can see now I have a little bit larger brush and the com completing the work. Yeah, don't look at the floor. The floor is completely messed up in our studio. Yeah. Please. So this is the end of my uh, work. Uh, these photographs are taken by uh, Zé Pavio from um, Brazil. So you can see on the right hand side is my uh, sketch, my rehearsal piece. And then on the left hand side, and then you can see a lot of acrylic paint somewhere in one gallon um, bucket, you can see. Please. And this is my art storage area. So uh, you can see the scale of uh, the artwork. Yeah, please, next. Oh, this is uh, maybe first uh, piece. Um, so I, I write it in the uh, Chinese ideographs, which are also used in uh, Japanese. And then in uh, the Chinese pronunciation is Ji Tai Tong Shao. And then Japanese pronunciation is Goku Sho Go Tai. Actually, uh, maybe Ji Shao Tong Dai. So, Goku uh, Sho Do Dai. Um, they are a little bit similar. So, this pronunciation in Japanese is called Sino Japanese translation. So, it's sort of taken from Chinese sound, but in you know pronounced in Japanese way and then we Japanese have two types of pronunciation uh, the other is called uh, indigenous Japanese for example like a mountain can be pronounced as Fujiyama Yama is a indigenous Japanese sound before the Chinese ideographs uh, introduced to Japan in the uh, 6th century. Uh, that was the only sound. And then Chinese uh, writing system was introduced for the first time. So that was the first time Japanese started writing. And then, so this is uh, like a Fuji san. San is a maybe Sino-Japanese sound for the mountain. Uh, it means extremely small is vast. So you can see that it's a um, paradox. You know, um, basically the paradox points to uh, freedom from conventional thinking, freedom from the self, uh, freedom from intellect. So uh, this is freedom from maybe the distinction between the sizes. Next one, please. This is a similar uh, concept. Rochu gets um, moon in a dewdrop. So, uh, dewdrop is so small. And then the, the moon, which is vast, is reflected even in a drop of water. So, that represents maybe. Uh, Dewdrop is us human being. We are small, short-lived. 
kind of different uh, full of delusions and then moon usually uh, is full moon means enlightenment a great awakening so even a small human being can uh, embody the uh, great uh, universal wisdom so that is the idea yeah please uh, next one this is also done by uh then master dogen 13th century um japanese monk who went to china and then brought the chinese zen chan teaching to japan and he was a great um, thinker and a great um, poet. And uh, so Jin Kai Fu Hiku, entire world flies in the sky. So that is a time when people believe that the earth is flat. And then uh, Earth is not flying, but um, so this is again you can see um, a paradox. Right? Yeah. Uh, next one, please. So, ichi nem man nem. So one moment. 10,000 years. So experience one moment. And then experience 10,000 years at the same time. So this is done by Shishuan, ninth century uh, Chinese Chan master. Yes, next one, please. So this is Tozan Suijoko. East Mountain walks on the water. Uh, of course, uh, mountains don't walk. So again, this is uh, uh, paradox but uh, maybe uh, I think um, Zen uh, uh, Buddhist practices kind of emphasizes meditation practice and also the enlightenment kind of uh, which is can be characterized characterized as maybe to see all things and all beings as one. So uh, we go beyond the kind of distinction between the subject and the object. So when we are one with the mountain, when we walk, the mountain walks. So Again, this is a paradox. And in a very concrete way and very poetic way, uh, Chan, Chinese Chan or Japanese Zen masters encourage people kind of saying something kind of uh, in in incomprehensive and then ask people to be awakened with the reality of uh, the world. So that is the idea of um, teaching with paradox. Please, next one. Muji doku go. With no self, get enlightened by yourself. 
So again, if uh, if you don't have self, how do you get enlightened by yourself? But in a way, I think uh, Zen really emphasizes being authentic to study and to be transmitted Dharma by an authentic teacher. So authenticity is very important, but also uh, your teacher does not kind of enlighten you. You have to be enlightened by yourself. So again, it is a paradox. Right? And then if you are kind of stuck to your own idea, kind of intellectual understanding of enlightenment, you don't get it. So you have to go beyond yourself, forget yourself. So in a way, you can see that this is the freedom from the self, kind of uh, preconceived idea or kind of intellectual idea of what is genuine experience. So freedom from the self. Yeah, please. Um, manne kenshiki. So, who ears see the form? So, see the form with your entire ears. Um, again, you know, you don't, uh, you only hear things with your ears, right? But how do you, uh, uh, see things with your ears and then uh, hear things with your eyes. So again, this is um, maybe calling for freedom from distinction between ears and uh, eyes and then forms and then sound. Yeah, please, next. Yeah, this is the shitsu. Um, that means um, just let go. Well, the first character is da, means strike, smash, and then get lost. Um, so you can see that uh, the canvas can really all the kind of splashes and then broken part of the brush. Um, and uh, also you can see the top and the bottom half rounds. So we have uh, half rounds, uh, two half rounds, sandwich the canvas and then screws from the back. And then before uh, putting the scrolls together, kind of my assistant, my studio assistant one, paints the uh, half rounds with antique gold, uh, acrylic paint. Any questions? The next, anytime, please raise your hand. I will be happy to respond to you. Next one, please. Yeah, so you saw it uh, earlier. So the uh, Muryo Heku Senman Okudo Sabutsu. So uncountable 100, 1000. 10,100 million times become a Buddha. So, um, so maybe, you know, in earlier times in Mahayana Buddhism, up to uh, maybe seventh century or so, uh, people were not really asking questions. How can I be enlightened? How can I become a Buddha? 
it's you know before they they were asking how can there be a bodhisattva, which is a kind of uh, uh, maybe those who are in search of the way the process of becoming a Buddha, but they never kind of ask you, know, how can I be a Buddha? It's like maybe in Christianity, you know, never ask, how can I be God? <laughs> it, it was the same, but uh, um, after the 7th century in Cham Buddhism, sort of, okay, maybe uh, with great insight, you can be enlightened. So that was the idea. And then this is more like Dogen, 13th century Japanese monk Dogen's um, saying that you can be anytime when you practice, practice is itself enlightenment, so you can become hundreds of millions of times become a Buddha. So again, this is a paradox, right? Yeah, please. So this is Shoujo no Shu. So practice with, no, realization within practice. Actually, this is on top of, so you can say realization on top of practice. So the idea is that uh, practice of meditation uh, or searching for the way is not only a process for enlightenment, but they cannot be separated. So. Um, Again, this is freedom from distinction between the process and the goal. Uh, next one, please. Do Kan. The first one is Do, or in Chinese, Dao, the way. This is uh, like a ring. Uh, we translate it as circle of the way. So, um, circle of, of the way, you can see that uh, it's a paradox, right? Usually the way is a kind of, uh, for, to mean the spiritual pursuit is you go a long way, you know, you know, crossing the mountains, crossing the ocean, and then finally you reach the goal, whether it is uh, union with God or go to the paradise or enlightenment. So there's a long, long way. But uh, Dogen says, I like to read it. Um, and then here, Dogen talks about four elements of uh, practice. One is aspiration for, for enlightenment, practice, Enlightenment and Nirvana. Nirvana is, uh, in Dogen's case, uh, non-duality. Be one with all things. Experience of not separate. So all things are separate and diverse, but also all things can be experienced as one. Right? That's Nirvana in Dogen's case. There are many meanings of, on Nirvana, as you can see. So Dogen says, on the great road of Buddha ancestors, there is always unsurpassable practice, continuous and sustained. It forms the circle of the way, is never cut off. Between aspiration, practice, enlightenment, and Nirvana, there is not a moment's gap continuous practice is a circle of the way. So uh, Dogen talks about Buddha ancestors. Buddhas are 
maybe lowercase Buddhas, that means awakened beings. So any one of us who practice meditation, even at the beginning of meditation, or beginners meditations, even for a moment, you sit and take a form of the enlightened one, you are already enlightened one. So we use the Buddha as lowercase in, the, in this case. Anyone can be awakened. Ancestor is a kind of like a, our teacher and the teacher's teacher and teacher's teacher up to the Shakyamuni Buddha. So it's a linear kind of uh, lines of uh, teachers and masters. So that's that's what it is in a uh, circle of the way. Um, cause there are yeah. several questions in oh, the yeah. in the chat. Mm -hmm. Would you like? Yeah, please. Um, Marianne asks: Are the two lower kanji the one hundred million? This is in the in becoming, um, in become a Buddha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are the one hundred million. Yeah. Um, can we go back to figure ten? Oh yeah, yeah. So the, the first two is uncountable. And then the third character is 100. And the fourth character is 1,000. And then uh, the next column, you know, we go from right to left. So left column on top is 10,000. And then uh, next one is Oku, that is 100 million. And then uh, the, the last small character is times. So, yes. Can I, uh, have I answered your question? Okay. The um, uh, next question is, is the white canvas background significant? Purity of the calligraphic expression? Um, is well, the... I think... Uh, you know, it's not really uh, complete white. I mix um, mm -hmm. some colors. Um, a little bit uh, brown, yeah. Uh, so off white, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's sort of. Uh, maybe uh, continue the tradition of uh, using rice paper. Yes. Uh -huh. Sometimes I, I paint the background, sometimes green or sometimes gold. Or... But in this series, I kind of, I try to challenge uh, I like to have a show in in a museum in Japan uh, it's not set set up yet uh, four of these uh, pieces were shown in for uh, a museum in Venice it's uh, in the uh, San Marco Plaza. It's a huge museum. Uh, along with um, 12 other pieces, all canvas pieces. Uh, some are painting, some are calligraphy. But um, uh, so at the moment, uh, that's the only uh, places I exhibited. Uh, this series, but I like to say to maybe East Asian people that you know you can, you can be 
we can be more expansive. We can use, uh, we can, we should be open to use Western medium. It has a great kind of merit and uh, you can make it big. Usually scrolls are not so big, right? Um, maybe five feet at most, five feet tall. But anyway. Um, is your calligraphy a form of meditation or a gift? <laughs> I think um, you can see that uh, maybe both, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a service, right? Yeah, trying to... The, uh, I think the, the reason I started this series is that, uh, you know, Zen Master Dogen is a great uh, thinker nowadays, kind of uh, inspiring uh, maybe practitioners and readers all all over the world but it, it's so difficult and then the reason is that uh, uh and then um i translated uh the master dogan's life work treasury of the true dharma i in japanese shobo genzo uh first into modern japanese with my Zen master and then I translated that into uh, English with uh, a lot of native speakers, practitioners, friends, maybe over 30 people. Uh, and uh, it's so difficult. And uh, even scholars and everybody um, the reason I thought, well, Dogen sort of sprinkles paradoxes everywhere. And then he's talking something, and then all of a sudden he says something very paradoxical. So I thought it would be nice to collect all his paradoxes in his uh, life work, Shobo Genzo, and then kind of classify them so that maybe we get some idea of why this is a paradox and then what's kind of how we should understand. So all the paradoxes are freedom from something, freedom from distinction uh, of the uh, sizes, or time span, or self and the others, practice and enlightenment, and then uh, we put them together in different categories, it would be kind of helpful to people to understand. So I picked about 300 uh, paradoxes from Dogen's main work, and then classified them. So that is sort of my uh, my service, yes. Can I have the next? Um, um, um there's, there's. Okay. Yeah. Two more questions. Mm -hmm. How are these hung on the wall, and do your knees get sore when you're painting on your knees? <laughs> you know, I'm I'm kind of used to uh, sit. Uh, Sometimes I use a cushion underneath, <laughs> so I don't I don't get sore. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not actually. I'm sitting right right on the uh, on the wooden floor. Maybe I have. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I don't have any cushion this time. Yeah, I'm so used to it. Yeah. When I was 13 years old, 14 years old, I was doing Aikido. We are 
throwing down each other on the wooden floor, and then we were sitting, Seiza, you know, uh, folded uh, legs on, on our knees for sometimes half an hour or one hour, listening to my master's talk. <laughs> and then, yeah. Okay, so this is Kekai Sekai Ki. So, um, the world of blossom flowers arises. So, in a way, it's a paradox. You can see blossom flowers is a small, maybe, area, but this is a world. It was done by uh, this poetic phrase was written by Rujin. Dogen's master, twelfth uh, to thirteenth century. Can I have the next one? So you can see this is rather unusual, very small character. That K no shu me. So K is a master the seed. So it's a very small, right? Contains and then. Sumer, Mount Sumeru, the Indian mythological mountain center of the world, the tallest mountain. So this is again, you can really see the uh, paradox of the size. A mustard seed contains the last, largest mountain, Mount Sumeru. This is from uh, one of the Mayana Buddhist scriptures, Vimalakirti Sutra. Yeah, please, next one. Can we have a next one? Yeah, okay. So, put your body into a fist. Can you do that? <laughs> Uh, in Zen, kind of, Zen people like to have a lot of concrete things. Okay, your crown, or top of your head, your eyeball, your nose, one your nostril, your fist. So, and in this case, yes. That's again, you know, maybe uh, how do you practice beyond the size? Yeah, please, next one. Yeah, ga jiki tan. So paint the unconceivable or paint directly. Uh, Dogen also says, paint spring, do not paint flowers and willows. So we usually try to paint flowers and then uh, trees to uh, express spring. But he said, you should be direct, just paint spring. So you know, maybe you show your presence, your kind of spirit. And that's directly experiencing the truth. Yeah, uh, next one, please. I go kaiten. So loving speech turns the heaven. So, um, again, okay, this is Dogen. Um, heaven means also the uh, emperor. So, maybe also change the emperor's mind, change the uh, course of the nation. 
but also I think uh, heaven can be just heaven too, you know. Uh, loving speech has such power. So don't think that just maybe a few words don't count, you know. Yeah, please, next one. So this is again, you know, uh, usually calligraphers don't do, East Asian calligraphers don't do extra big character and an extra small character together. But uh, this is Ban So Ju. So Ban is a big ball and then runs or rolls, and then this is um, pearl. So um, a ball rolls on a pearl. Usually a pearl rolls inside a ball. So this is an upside down language, you can see. It's like a forest running around a hunting dog. <laughs> something like that. So this is one kind of uh, maybe technique of uh, expressing paradoxes. So maybe the life is full of paradoxes. And then like, okay, maybe practice and enlightenment are separate so that we can practice hard to be enlightened. On the other hand, practice and enlightenment are not separate. So, okay, which way shall we take? Or each time we can, we have uh, maybe a uh, different idea. So you and I are separate, but also you, are, I, uh, you and I can be together or not separate or one. And then, how do we uh, kind of keep boundaries and being ethical at the same time, you know, being one? So that is a paradox. That is the uh, basic, maybe, uh, how do you say, uh, practice of our life in each moment. Please, next one. Oh, Supreme Way uh, is itself not a paradox, but usually uh, Supreme Way is not difficult by Sanchan, the uh, six to seven century master, regarded as the third ancestor of Chan Buddhism in China. So, um, so Supreme Way is not difficult, is a paradox. Sorry. Yeah, please, next one. Um, and then also, this is uh, also um, so you can see that uh, uh, I try to use different styles sometimes. The uh, top part is close to the uh, formal script, but it's maybe more like semi-cursive script. The second character is semi-cursive, third character Shin, which is um, mind or heart, is cursive script. So um, I try to use uh, maybe different styles. These are the three main, most basic styles of uh, East Asian calligraphy. So everyday mind, Again, this is not a paradox, but usually uh, 
the eighth to ninth century Chinese Zen master Nan Chuan, his word is every everyday mind is enlightenment. That paradox. You know. Any questions so far? Yeah, next one, please. So, Uji, uh, being time or existing time by Dogen. So, Dogen is the only kind of uh, philosopher who actually did a very kind of uh, wrote an amazing essay called Uji, Time Being. And he says mm, mm, a being time. So being is time. So uh, existence and time cannot be separate. So in a way, I think it was very interesting. A 20th century German philosopher Heidegger said, okay, I, maybe I'm the first one who really investigate the issues of time. But actually, uh, 700 earlier than that Dogen was saying. And then Dogen was saying that uh, time and separate and the self are not separate. And also saying the moment and eternity are not separate. Anyway, this, um, he wrote an amazing uh, essay, Uji, yeah. Um, Kaz, could you speak about your seal or your chop? Oh. Yeah, this is my artist name, One Mountain Person. So that's my artist name, Ichi San Jin. Yes. Um, but I think uh, this is, uh, you know, the original was carved on a stone, fairly small, and a little bit uh, bigger than one inch by one inch. But um, I had um, rubber stamps of different sizes made. So maybe people despise rubber stamps. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, stone uh, seals do not print well on the uh, canvas. So I use this yes mm -hmm. and one more another question is in the everyday mind and existence time how do you create the splatter <laughs> um by mistakes <laughs> um before uh jackson pollock it was a kind of real shame for a calligrapher to have any kind of drips. You know, people talked about, okay, they tried many, many times, and then they finally got the kind of the piece they can be proud of, and then the ink dropped, something like that. But thanks to Jackson Pollock, now kind of spatters and drips a part of uh, important part of uh, artwork. And how are these hung on the wall? Oh, um, we have um, string. So, you know, when we put the uh, half rounds together on top, we put the strings too, you know, around the uh, Screws, yeah. 
This is all my professional secret. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so shall we go to the next one? Oh, Ichinyo, one, not one. So you, you can see the no is almost like like one and it's like one. So in a way, I think uh, I translated as one, not one. So that's the kind of basic, maybe, you can say paradigm of uh, maybe Buddhism in that means we are all in one, but we are separate, we are diverse. So how do we kind of uh, deal with this you know, in everyday life, in everyday understanding? So that is a, a basic question. And then all the koans, you know, this um, paradoxical questions like, okay, Bodhidharma came from India to China. What is the meaning? And then the master says, Cy cypress tree in the yard. So it doesn't make sense, right? And then students have to struggle with it. What does it mean? I mean Maybe the essential teaching of Zen is maybe a tree standing there. And what does it mean? They are one or not one. They are alive or not alive. So that is a kind of studying koans, studying some kind of uh, paradoxical questions is the more important uh, studies of uh, Zen than studying scriptures for m many people. For Dogen, studying scripture was very important. But um, anyway, shall we go to the next one? A couple of questions. Yeah. Are the works hung or viewed in any particular order? Is this a finite series of Master Dogen's philosophy for exhibition or a continual practice of expression that you undertake? Well, I, I've written a, maybe a proposal and a catalog. So I kind of, I, I talked about uh, maybe um, my own categories. First one is freedom from the self, and then freedom from the maybe space and time, and so forth. So uh, this this is the order of uh, illustrations in my catalog and then proposal for an exhibition. Uh, but when it is exhibited, I think uh, any anyone who uh, maybe curator will decide how to. Uh, show them. They may not show all of them, right? Yeah, please. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Is it unusual to explain paradoxes? Is this more for a Western audience, or would you present differently to an Eastern audience? No, exactly the same. I actually uh, wrote a proposal in Japanese, too. They are exactly uh, power. Yeah. I think um, you know um, Dogen is difficult and then Zen teaching is difficult for everybody in East or West so 
I think uh, this my essay has been already published in Japan Study Journal, um, you know, collection of academic papers last year. So it's already uh, maybe in the world. And I think it is maybe helpful to understand maybe Zen process. Shall we go to the next one? Daiyu. So that means a great function. Um, so great function is um, often there is something very small, maybe a joke or some maybe splashes of the uh, or paint, or cracks of a table, anything that changes people's con consciousness, or people's perceptions, or people's life. So that is a great function, you know. Of course, you know uh, that is. It's often not intended, but maybe it can inspire people a great deal. That's a great function. Yeah, please. Did it take time to learn to work so large? I have your pardon? Did it take time to learn to work so large? Time to create? Well, um, the process is, you know, um, okay. The first day, my studio assistant, Juan, will cut the canvas and staple it on the floor, maybe two pieces. And then uh, prime the canvas with just so. And um, maybe two coats. And next day, I maybe I paint and then let it dry. And then next day, I varnish the painting, acrylic varnish. And then maybe uh, one comes, and then he cuts it. I'll tell him where to cut it. So he cuts it, and then he uh, makes the uh, cut the uh, half rounds, paint paint them, and then put them together. So at least it takes four days. So, um, so that's the time uh, it takes, but in a way, yeah. I think the questioner wanted to know, was it difficult to switch from doing small uh, lettering to doing um, a standard size scroll, for example, to doing these seven foot scrolls. Was it difficult to change that? Well, ratio? I think, um, you know, um, I, I didn't see any need for creating such a kind of tall uh, uh, scrolls, <laughs> first of all. I mean, um, it's uh, it's difficult to sell, first of all. And uh, um, so it took me some years 
to come up with this idea. Only I came up with this series of uh, artwork on paradoxes. Then I thought maybe this would be the right size. So it, it took me a long time. And maybe it took me 1,700 years. <laughs> So we have a few more to show, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, not born. Who show in Japanese? Not born. So, or beyond life. Maybe beyond life is a better translation, right? Um, so we are born, we, and also this is alive. So we are alive. So being free from being life, I think in a way, you know, um, Zen teaching is that, uh, or Buddhist teaching, each moment we, we die and we are reborn. So, and then not born is interesting. Maybe each moment we are not born, we are not alive, and then we are alive. So it's a paradox, right? And in a way, I think uh, maybe experiencing each moment as kind of dying each moment, uh, is uh, actually a very good practice. We we don't maybe avoid thinking about death, but we face death and we become happy uh, for a kind of strange reason. Okay, can we have the next one? Shichu tokukatsu. So in death, find life or find the vitality. Again, this is a kind of a, a paradox. And this is commonly used, you know, maybe like a game, okay? You you, uh, you throw out the important, maybe, uh, how do you say, um, peace, and then, to win. So maybe, uh, anyway, so that is paradoxical. This was actually uh, first taught by Don Shan, ninth century Chinese master. Finally, we have, uh, <clears throat> actually, there are two more, please, yeah. So this is like a dot, dot, dot. So maybe I translate as exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. You know, it's a language, but it's not a language. It doesn't mean anything. So, you know, we should be free from the language. So that's the idea. And finally, a circle. So this is um, six feet wide and seven feet tall. And uh, so a circle is an infinite paradox, you know. Um, anyone can draw a circle, but also every circle is different. There's no composition, no design, or no plan needed. And every circle of the same person varies. And the state of the mind of the person who is drawing is revealed. Circle, open or closed, is both inside and outside, inclusive and exclusive 
perfect and imperfect, meaningless and meaningful, ambiguous and straightforward, momentary and timeless. So this is uh, maybe, how do you call it? Maybe uh, like a logo for the series of my um, painting calligraphy on paradox. Thank you so much. Um, Kaz, there's one last question. I think okay. it's the last one. What was your essay that was published last year and is there a way to access it? Um, okay. It's um, Japan Studies Review, 2023, published by Florida International University. I think there will be an online version, too. Um, who was the publisher again? Florida International University. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'm putting this Very in good. the uh, I'm putting I put that in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well it's been a great pleasure to work with you and then thank you so much for your kind of listening. Somebody just asked, um, do you ever play with a scenic writing? Which is Oh, uh, no, I'm Jewish by marriage, but uh, I don't do that. Uh, you know, I, I I study Western calligraphy, you know, like uh, when uh, Monica Dengo and then I teach East and West calligraphy, um, when she teaches, I'm her students. So I study italics and and then one time, so we had some kind of more like improvis improvisational time. So I thought maybe I should start a kind of new style of calligraphy in a Western style. So I I was kind of developing uh, drunken flourish. You can see flourish, but it's done in a drunken way. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cox. Thank you. My pleasure. It was fascinating because I know so little about Zen philosophy. It was a really interesting introduction. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear you speak about the paradoxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, be well. Yeah. Be fresh and young. Yeah. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Your beautiful work and his service to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. The recording will be available um, okay. either later today or tomorrow, and we'll have it on the Forensic Calligraphy website. So yeah. thank you thank so you much for coming today. So if you go to the Friends of Calligraphy website, it is on the resources tab. Scroll down to the bottom of the page to um, to the list of videos that we have available. Okay. So nice to see everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, all. So, Nancy, Bye. I, 
I'm bye gonna bye. End the meeting. Thank I'm you. Gonna I'm going to end it. Thank you so much. You can stop recording, Nancy. Um, Evelyn, this is Claudia. Claudia, hi. Hi. I'm not sure who it was, but somebody, I think, changed Pamela Rohde's um, name on her Zoom thing, and mine got changed to her. You see me? <laughs> I, don't. I hope that's not permanent. <laughs> yes, it is not oh, it permanent. What is your name? I will change you right now. Uh, my name is Claudia. Okay, Claudia, stand by. <clears throat> I think when people change it during this time, it usually is changed just for this meeting. And that, that, is, is, okay. that is correct. That's good. That's good. Okay, not to worry. You don't have to do me. Nancy. No, no, already done. Okay. <laughs> Nancy, I think you can stop recording. I did. Oh, oh, I, I did. Hold on. Nope.